This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Well, at the end of our previous session, we labelled the three types of lifetime transfer that an individual may make. They were quite simply, and you'll see them here, as noted. They could simply be transfers between spouses or civil partners. Any such transfer is exempt. It could be a transfer into a trust, and transfers into trusts are known as chargeable lifetime transfers, meaning that we don't have to wait around to see if the taxpayer dies within the next seven years or not. They are immediately chargeable, albeit at a lifetime rate, and if you die within seven years of having made them, as we'll see, probably not in this lecture, but uh, I would reckon in our next lecture together, then not only are they chargeable when made in lifetime, but if you die within seven years of having made one, then an additional tax charge may also be levied. Now, I think we'll, we'll total, of course, between the lifetime tax and the tax arising on there, nothing will total more than a 40% tax charge being applicable. It's just that some of that 40% may have been made and paid in lifetime. All of the other transfers, so the vast majority of transfers, transfers to individuals other than your spouse, all of these were labelled as potentially exempt transfers, pets. And what we're going to see now in this session is how to deal not just with one pet, one potentially exempt transfer that happens to become chargeable, but it's much more interesting where we may have two or more such lifetime transfers made within the seven years of death that become chargeable as a result of the death of the taxpayer. And that will vividly illustrate what we have called this tax for the very outset. That is that it is a cumulative donor-based tax. You cannot look at any one individual lifetime transfer in isolation and attempt to compute the IHT thereon. This is a cumulative donor-based tax, and we work on this seven-year cycle here in terms of the computation of IHT arising on death. And as we'll see later, as we said in our next lecture together, when we deal with the lifetime transfers chargeable when made, those transfers into trusts. So what do we know about these pets already? And then we'll see an example where we have multiple pets being made and how important that is as regards the use of the available nil rate band. So a pet is a lifetime gift made by an individual to another individual, transfers into trusts or CLTs, and the only other individual you might see is your spouse or civil partner, in which case such transfers are exempt. So to any other individual other than your spouse or civil partner, we're talking these are pets. With a pet, the original assumption is that the gift will be exempt. They are potentially exempt transfers when they are made. We work on the basis that they would be exempt. So there is no IHT liability at the date of the gift. But then the clock starts to tick for our taxpayer. And if the donor survives for more than seven years for making the gift, then that what was potentially exempt when made, the pet potentially exempt when made, becomes exempt because you've survived for the requisite seven year period. So the pet becomes fully exempt and is therefore ignored for IHT purposes. Don't worry about this little note here, you'll see it later, though it may still use up the annual exemptions. What we have uh, with all of the taxes that uh, we've seen for individuals, with income tax, you had a personal allowance, a level of tax free income. With CGT, you had an annual exempt amount, a, a level of exempt gains. And so it is that also with IHT, when we make lifetime transfers, there is an annual exemption that is also available. That one is a level of £3,000 a year, and that £3,000 has not changed. It is a constant throughout all of the dates that you will be dealing with in terms of your exam. But we'll look at those exemptions. The annual is one such exemption there. But we'll look at those a little bit later in this chapter. If, of course, as is going to happen, the donor dies within seven years of making the gift, then it becomes chargeable on the death of the donor. 
potentially exempt when made, no IHT to be made in lifetime, only as a result of the death of the taxpayer within seven years of having made that pet. IHT is then payable at 40% on the value of the gift, once of course that is that we've used up any available nil rate band. In the previous examples that we were looking at, I think we had a £200,000 lifetime transfer made within the seven years before the date of death. And that simply meant that when the taxpayer did sadly die, with that one transfer of 200000 it being the only transfer becoming chargeable on the death of the taxpayer, it enjoyed the full £325,000 nil rate band and would have used up 200000 of that 325000 nil rate band, assuming that the individual concern only has one nil rate band they haven't had an unused nil rate band transferred to them of any amount. So you use up that nil rate band, whatever is the available figure, firstly on the lifetime transfers. In the examples we did, it meant that if you'd used 200 of the nil rate band on lifetime transfers made in the seven years before death, only 125,000 nil rate band remained to then be set against the chargeable estate and then the balance would be at 40%. What we are likely to see, I would say guaranteed somewhere in this examination of ours, we are going to see, is that we're going to have one or more, probably two indeed, if not more, uh, transfers made in lifetime within the seven years before the date of death, and the cumulative total of those transfers will exceed the nil rate band, so there will be some tax to pay. If the taxpayer did survive for at least three years, so if you die within seven years, the pet becomes chargeable. Now, if of course it is all within, as we've previously seen, the available nil rate band, there is no tax to pay. Once we've exhausted that nil rate band, then it's a 40% rate of tax that is due as a result of the death of the taxpayer. And that 40% tax charge then would be reduced if the taxpayer survived for at least three years from the date of the gift. Any IHT charge is reduced by the available taper relief. Now again, that's in note five below. Uh, the levels taper there, they uh, start that if you manage to survive, for between three to four years from the date of death to the uh, back to the lifetime transfer. If you survive from that date uh, for three between three to four years, you can have a 20% reduction in your tax charge. This reduces the tax charge, does taper relief. And then it moves up in 20 percentage points, such that if you manage to survive between six and seven years, it didn't quite get to the seven years that would have made the entire transfer exempt, which if you die between six and seven years from the date of that lifetime transfer, then any tax charge would be reduced by 80%. So we have 20%, 40%, 60%, 80%. These figures are actually given to you on your rates and allowances page. Not that I think you'll need them because they're so obvious, but that information is made available to you. So we soften the blow, as it were, that if you have managed to survive for at least three years, but not seven, then the closer and closer you get to that, I have to call it a deadline there, that's rather inappropriate, isn't it? No pun intended, by the way. Uh, the closer you get to that seven years survival date, then if you do sadly die, then at least the amount of tax that becomes payable is going to be less. It'll be reduced by the taper relief, as I say, levels of which given on your tax rates and allowances, and we'll see in a separate section later in these notes. I said a moment ago that it is very likely that there'll be more than one pet. And where more than one pet has occurred within the seven years before death, that nil rate band is applied strictly on a chronological basis, strictly First come, first serve. The earliest transfer becoming chargeable on death, the earliest one within the seven years before death, 
it will be the first to benefit from the available nil rate band. And as you move closer and closer to the date of death, later in time, closer to the date of death, then we use up that nil rate band on lifetime transfers purely on a chronological basis there. The earlier transfers benefit first from that nil rate band. And we have here a little illustration. It takes us back to illustration four, which in turn takes you back to illustration two. But all it did was illustration two said that the taxpayer died at the chargeable estate of £750,000. And this added in that there'd been one chargeable transfer of value that had been made in June 2019, that was, of course, within the seven years of the date of death, of 200,000. We just called it a chargeable transfer of value. We may actually have referred to it by its proper name there, PET. But now we know that this such transfer being to an individual there, other than your spouse, made in the seven years before death, that PET will become chargeable on death. But what's going to happen now in illustration? Uh, uh, seven here is that we're going to see two chargeable transfers that occurred in lifetime again both within the seven years of the date of death the date of death here i think was the first of february 2021 and we've got these two transfers of two hundred thousand pounds each the first in june 2019 and the second one in august 2020 now, you should be able to see already from what I've already said to you in this lecture and what you've seen in previous, is that those lifetime transfers being made within the seven years before the date of death become taxable on death and they will use up the nil rate band strictly on a chronological basis. So there's your first one in June 19 at 200,000. 200 is less than 325, so there'll be no tax to pay in relation to that lifetime transfer. But the second one in August 2020, now that's going to use up the remaining £125,000 of nil rate band, but of course then the remaining 75000 is going to be taxed at 40%. Because of the dates that I've given to you there, both in fact being within three years of the date of death, we as yet are not dealing with taper relief. There'll be no reduction in the tax charge that arises on that particular transfer. Let's just see how we lay this information out to compute our answer to it. It's a computation that we can label lifetime transfers chargeable on death. At the moment, the only such transfers we're seeing are pets becoming chargeable because they were made within the seven years before the date of death. Go back to the earliest of these transfers made within the seven years before date of death and note it. June 19, PET, refer to a gross transfer here. More of these expressions later. Uh, you can label it whatever you like, in all honesty, but I'll refer to it as a gross transfer. That is £200,000. And that, of course, uses 200000 of the 325 nil rate band, so there's no tax to pay. Along comes then the next pet of 200,000 in August 2020. Uh, so we utilize the remaining nil rate band of 125,000. That still leaves a balance of 75,000 to be taxed at 40%. And that will be a figure of 30,000 pounds of IHT. And we put that into our inheritance tax, our IHT column there. Of course, as well as computing how much tax is to be paid as a result of the death of the taxpayer, we also need to identify, so who's going to pay that and when will it have to be paid? The £30,000 liability will be paid by the donor, whoever the individual was that received that gift, they are the person, they will be the person who is responsible for paying that tax. Interestingly, therefore, you can now see the cumulative nature of this taxation at work. Individual number one who received that PET in June 2019 benefited from the entire nil rate band. So the entire 200,000 
had no tax to pay upon it. The next transfer used up the remaining balance of the nil rate band, but 75,000 was pushed up into the 40% band and therefore created this 30,000 liability. So that means that whoever received that gift that we have the gross transfer amount of in terms of this computation of 200,000 is then as a result of the taxpayer sadly dying within seven years of having made it, to be more precise as well, within three years of having made it, then that tax charge will be paid in full, no taper relief here, no reduction in that tax charge, but that will have to be paid by whoever received that transfer back in August 2020. As the August 2020 pet is less than three years from the date of death, that date of death, the 1st of February 2021 in the original example, no taper relief is available to reduce the tax charge, but again, we'll see the specific note on that and bring it into play in a later lecture. As the nil rate band has been fully used on the lifetime transfers, the entire chargeable estate of £750,000 will be taxed at 40%, giving a further liability of 300000 to be paid by the personal representatives there. And again, the tax will have to be paid within six months after, or by six months after the end of the month in which the death occurred. That again is when, as we spoke of last time, that's when all of the inheritance tax becomes payable on death, both in relation to lifetime transfers and also in relation to the death estate there. It can be seen, therefore, that if the taxpayer survives for more than seven years from the date of the pet, it will be both exempt in its own right and addition will have no effect on the chargeability of either those lifetime transfers falling within the seven years before the death or on the chargeable estate itself. If, therefore, we had this illustration or this situation, as in this illustration 8 here, that as with the illustrations we've just been talking about, had there been an earlier pet of another £200,000 eight years before the date of death, then this would be exempt and would have no effect on the amount of IHT payable on either the later pets or on the chargeable estate. So you would still have a computation that looked like this. We only want lifetime transfers chargeable on death. The only ones chargeable on death will be those made within the seven years before death. And if as here, these transfers are pets, then they will be taxed on a first come first serve, a purely chronological basis, and uh, any tax charge potentially being reduced by the taper relief that again we talk about later there. But that earlier 200,000 would be ignored on this computation. That pet eight years before death was not chargeable when made and is not chargeable on death. It is not going to have any tax to pay on it and it's not going to affect the tax that is payable on those transfers there that do fall within the seven years of the date of death. Again, the cumulative nature of this taxation. We've seen there two transfers made in the seven years before the date of death. How we've used up the nil rate band on a chronological basis. That 200 got the first 200. We used up the remaining 125. If therefore, before the date of death, there had been another pet following on, now I think the date of death was the 1st of February 2021, so the next transfer could be fairly soon. So, so even later in 2020, maybe December 2020, there had been another gross transfer of 200,000, such that now the cumulative total in the seven years before death came to 600,000 it would mean that all of that 200,000 would be taxed at 40%, and that therefore would create an IHT figure of £80,000 that would be payable in relation to that lifetime transfer. So you could see here that we could have had three beneficiaries all receiving the same amount of lifetime gift, that which amounted to a gross transfer 
at £200,000. They all have that. And yet we see strikingly different amounts of tax payable. Because the amount of tax that is payable is nothing to do with the situation of the donee. It's everything to do with the donor. It is a cumulative donor-based tax. A cumulative donor-based tax. And what does that mean? It means here that first 200,000 had no tax to pay by the particular beneficiary, the person receiving that gift. The third one here that we've just introduced, that 200,000, that poor individual has got an IHT liability of £80,000 to pay. And the one in the middle got some benefit out of the new rate band, but also suffered some amount of tax amounting there to £30,000. Same amounts of gifts, very different outcomes. As I said to you, and as I'll keep repeating this, you cannot look at any individual transfer in isolation and attempt to compute the IHT thereon. Each of those three transfers, the same amount, 200000 but very different outcomes in terms of the amount of tax to be paid, given the cumulative nature of this tax. It is a cumulative donor-based tax, as we keep saying. Moving on here then, the residence nil rate band does not apply to lifetime transfers that become chargeable as a result of the donor's death within seven years and will only be used therefore in computing the IHT payable on the death estate. Yes, that residence nil rate band is very specific. There must be the main residence being gifted to a direct descendant, be that child, grandchild, great-grandchild, whatever it might be there, given to a direct descendant on the death of the taxpayer. Only then does the residence nil rate band come into play. Your normal nil rate band, 325, potentially as high as 650,000, as we saw in previous examples, if there was a 100% unused nil rate band to be transferred, from the previously deceased spouse, they didn't use any of their nil rate band, so 100% is the unused proportion, therefore meaning that the previously surviving spouse, now sadly deceased, would get their 325 plus another 100% of that 325 as the unused proportion transferred from their former spouse or civil partner. So here, residence nil rate band, only available against the chargeable estate of death. Illustration nine. Daisy, as in pushing up, no doubt, Daisy died on the 13th of April 2021, leaving a death estate valued at £500,000, which included her main residence, valued at £360,000. Daisy's entire estate was left to her grandchildren was left to her grandchildren there. Right, as soon as you therefore see that we have a main residence contained within the death estate, and we know that the estate was gifted outright all of it, therefore the house as well, to her grandchildren, they are direct descendants, therefore the residence nil rate band will be available. This time, of course, what we're also going to have is a lifetime transfer where Daisy had made a pet of £375,000 to her daughter back on the 30th of June 19. So, as a result of the death within seven years of that pet, again, there are two computations to be done. Those two computations to be done are going to be, they're going to be, as we've just seen with illustration uh, seven up here, we're going to have the uh, individual lifetime transfers chargeable there on death, lifetime transfers chargeable on death. And we're also, of course, going to have the chargeable estate, in that case, 750,000 being charged. So two computations arising as a result of the death of the taxpayer. The first one to be prepared is this one, as we've seen, lifetime transfers chargeable on death. There's only one pet, 30th of June 19. 
but it is a gross transfer of 375. That exceeds 325, so the entire nil rate band is used on that one transfer to the daughter, pushing 50,000 out of the nil rate band and therefore into the 40% band. That is £20,000 in terms of tax to be paid. Who pays it? The daughter will have to pay that, she being the specific beneficiary. What is then the content of the chargeable estate at death, the death estate? As the main residence that was 360 out of a total of 500, so whatever the other net assets might be, they total £140,000. We now need to compute the IHT liability. Well, there's uh, no uh, nil rate band now available. That's been fully utilised against the lifetime transfer, the PET. But there is a residence nil rate band. You'll notice here, of course, there's been no mention of a previously deceased spouse uh, who had not used a proportion of their nil rate band. So there's no transfer of that across here. Uh, that would be explicit within a question were it to be relevant in terms of the transferability of the unused nil rate band or unused residence nil rate band there. No such figures here, but she does have her own 175 residence nil rate band. That does not exceed 360,000. If here the value of the main residence had been 160, then this would also be 160. It can't be bigger than the value of that main residence there. 360, though, is way bigger than 175, so the full 175 is available, and that will therefore leave 325,000, the remaining 325, out of that chargeable estate at death to be taxed at 40% to give us the IHT chargeable on the death estate. As we've just seen, the nil rate band was fully utilised by the PET, the death estate still benefits from the residence nil rate band. If the pet had been a gift of her main residence, then no residence nil rate band would have applied. Again, it's only available where the main residence, as here, is left within the estate, and then also, of course, the important imperative gifted to direct descendants. If Daisy had been a widow, and a previous deceased spouse had used his nil rate band, but had not used his residence nil rate band, then a 350,000 residence nil rate band would have been available on her death estate. If, as we've said, that residence, that main residence, was held by her and was part of her death estate when she died. We mentioned there about on those lifetime transfers becoming chargeable as a result of the death of the taxpayer, that they become chargeable because the taxpayer dies within seven years of having made them, of course. But if you manage to survive for more than three years, rather than the examples we've had up until now, where the lifetime transfers were made within three years of the date of death, but if you survive for between three to seven years from the date of the transfer to the date of death, then you're going to get this thing called taper relief. Uh, again, it starts if you manage to survive between three to four years, uh, 20%, going up to 80% if you manage to survive between six and seven years. These figures, as shown there, will be supplied to you. That table is provided in your rates and allowances information in the examination there. But again, it's not difficult. You probably you don't imagine you'll have to look that up. You will have to count carefully through, though, on your fingers there from the date of the transfer in lifetime through to the date of death. So between how many and how many years is that? Is it between three to four, four to five, five to six or six to seven years? And then that taper relief that is applied to the tax charge. It reduces the tax charge. It does not reduce what is chargeable to tax it reduces the tax charge itself. So illustration 10 now. As in illustration 7, you may recall that we had two lifetime transfers, but now the two lifetime transfers, both of £200,000, we're pushing back in time. So they occur 
more than three years before the date of death, though, of course, within the seven years of the date of death. So in January 16, June 17, remember there that uh, the taxpayer died, I think it was the 1st of February 2021. So what have we got? Compute the amount of, oops, compute the amount of IHT payable as a result of D's death. So we've got, again, lifetime transfers becoming chargeable on death. The earliest one, January 16, again, they're all pets, these are. £200,000, there's still no tax. So whenever that transfer had been made, it was going to benefit from the new rate band in full, no tax to be paid. If there's no tax to be paid, then there's no taper relief. Remember, it is a reduction in the tax charge. June 17, PET, another 200,000, created the same computation as before, a £30,000 figure of tax. But now, of course, we need to establish whether any taper relief is available to reduce that tax charge there. Now, as the PET falls between three to four years from the date of death, the tax charge may be reduced by taper relief of 20%. So June 17, now remember the taxpayer died in February 2021. So June 17, we go June 18, June 19, June 20. Did we get to June 21? No, we got to June 20. We got through to February 21. We didn't get through to June 21. So that therefore is between three and four years from the date of uh, the lifetime transfer. The death between three to four years from the date of that transfer. That therefore qualifies for the lowest amount of taper relief, a 20% reduction in that tax charge. And that's what we see there, £6,000, 20% of 30000 bringing down the tax charge to 24000 Sorry about the columns not being particularly straight there. Don't know what's going on. Can't get the help, Kenneth. Just can't get the help. And as we say here, as in illustration seven, the nil rate band has been fully utilized on the lifetime transfers made in the seven years before death. So the entire chargeable estate, again, that was 750,000, is taxed at 40%, and that therefore doesn't change it. It's an, IH, an IHT liability of 300,000 pounds that will become due. As we kept on stressing, it can be seen that the amount of tax that arises are either transfers made in lifetime or then resultantly at, on death with the chargeable estate coming into charge, we can't compute that tax in isolation. And it's nothing to do with the circumstances of the donee. It's all to do with the donor. It is a cumulative donor-based tax. Whether something is going to have IHT paid on it has got nothing to do with the personal circumstances of the recipient, the donee of that lifetime gift, or indeed of the charge of an estate. It's everything to do with the donor. And as regards those lifetime transfers, as we've seen so far, eh, the ones that become chargeable on death, the pets, we will always apply our nil rate band on a first come, first serve basis. Now, having said there that the type of transfer that's become chargeable on death. They were pets. What we'll see in our next session together is transfers being made into trust. Now, you don't have to worry about what they are. As I may have mentioned uh, earlier in the, the course, trust, just think about them as a separate taxable person. But if we have a transfer into a trust, then we don't wait around to see if the taxpayer dies within the next seven years it becomes chargeable when made using the rates in force at that date when it was made. Now, that's still likely to be, you're going to be looking at a nil rate band of 325. If we go a long, long way back, it might still just happen. But if we're long enough back so that the nil rate band was less than 325 for that particular date when it was made, then they would tell you the amount of nil rate band that was applicable. But those are chargeable lifetime transfers. And how we tax them when made 
and how if you then die within seven years of having made that transfer into a trust, it becomes chargeable again on death and additional tax may be payable. How that system works, possibly the, the more awkward part, at least more awkward of the part of the course so far, see how that tax is computed in lifetime and what then happens if you die within seven years of having made them and additional tax becoming payable. All of that we will see in our next session together. Between now and then, make sure you understood what we've dealt with here when dealing with those pets and being able to compute the amount of IHT that becomes payable as a result of the death of the taxpayer within seven years of having made those potentially exempt transfers.